Welcome to Rubber Bands, an Avenues Recovery Podcast. Conversations about the push and pull of addiction and recovery. And now, here's your host, Shlomo Hoffman. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Episode 8 of Rubber Bands, conversations about the push and pull of addiction and recovery. We continue to shed light on the world of addiction treatment by talking to the people who make up its heart and its soul, those who have gone through it and those that have helped them get through it, sharing their experiences and insight and how people can find their way back from the darkest places and light up the world for themselves and those that love them. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming in studio Joe Van Wee. Joe, our Avenue's in-house creative genius, has juggled an award-winning career in filmmaking along with managing a number of successful political campaigns. The haze of addiction and the blessing of recovery has touched him personally, and he's eager to share his experiences of the highs and lows of reaching the top of his profession, the aching loneliness and struggles with addiction, and the peace he has found in a simpler life rooted in recovery. Joe, welcome. How have you been? Thanks, Shlomo. Thanks for having me, and thanks to Avenus. It was a very flattering introduction. Um, (laughs) I'm glad to be here today, and... um, I am flattered to get a chance anytime I could now to speak on recovery and my struggles with it because it's the truth of who I am. And I've had periods of sobriety where, I don't know, it felt like uh, something I wasn't going to wear on my sleeve. If it was part of my identity, I wouldn't want you to know about. And I don't know, that that creates a really deep conflict in someone who wants to embrace recovery. So I'm glad to speak to that today. And and be here. Thank you. So let's let's start from the beginning. Um, it didn't take you long to discover the joys of alcohol, from what I understand. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Not when you're from Scranton. Right? <laughs> there is no tap water. It's just whiskey that runs through our, <laughs> our pipes there. Uh, no, it didn't. Uh, you know, oddly enough, alcohol probably for generations was common, probably on both sides of my family. But my mother was, she didn't drink around us or have it around the house. By that time, maybe at an early age in the 80s, my father struggled with addiction. Um, Is that specifically alcohol? Or? Alcohol, cocaine, uh, you know, criminality. He was a pretty gangster type. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, so are you a made man? Me? No, <laughs> we're Irish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So I, I was I was understanding of the idea that alcohol could have a really damaging effect. There was that was probably the first memory I had. I'm a kid of the '80s, dare programs, sports camps. It wasn't something that looked attractive by any means, uh, unless I saw it romantically in a movie that it was something people indulged in. But by '83, '84, my father was in recovery. And we, to, to reconcile our family, my mother brought us to a rehab where he was going to celebrate a year. Wow. And was he away from home? Was he doing it outpatient? He was, was that... away. He went out. He's the type. He took off to do something. He'd be in Florida for two years. And you, you, you wouldn't see. I'm sure He's your a, mom was thrilled. Uh, yeah, she was. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it gave me a perspective of where people go when the, you, you hang up your guns. You you go to a rehab. It was Marworth. Marworth was like a uh, – but the Scranton family donated their summer home to become a drug and alcohol treatment center. And rehab surged then. So I saw A as a really strange place where people like gangsters retired or you went to sell insurance after drinking – the drinking game ended – it, and my mother thought it was an obscene place. Uh, they're laughing about, uh, you know, horrible things they do and that nor, no normal person uh, would do. And he get a, he got a medallion and a cake for joining civil society like this was something to celebrate. She, she found it foul. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get cake. We got shoved in the car. And we had to leave. <laughs> this place is insane. They're celebrating your father. So that was my first recollection of AA. I didn't, you know, I'm seven, eight years old at the time. So I, you know. Were your parents together? Were no, you, no, no. This was to, my mother didn't want us to cash, share her judgments on my dad at that early age. It was going to be up to us. So she was, she was pretty. It seems like you got liberal. on the train. Yeah. Well, I got to appreciate my dad for what he is and how that has no effect on me becoming an adult. Um, right. I couldn't reconcile that in early age. It was a very, 
volatile relationship, especially in my teenage years. But I think a lot of that had to do with despising how much I probably could be like him, um, how much I didn't, I, I didn't see my dad as someone, as a victim of trauma, maybe to sympathize with a dad I didn't know before I was born, could really kind of alleviate and, and pepper right. you up for forgiveness. Like, who was my dad as a child? Right. Like, who am I going to blame for my problems, my trauma, my addiction? And you get back to the 16th century, and it's like, oh, that's that guy. <laughs> he was wearing a kilt, some maniac. Got us all in trouble with booze. But it's, it's ridiculous. But to not acknowledge that, there is a feeling of that because it's immediate. Here's parents. They're causing these problems. Here's grandparents. But if you can let go of that, you, you can see time from a bigger scale. It's addiction is an existential problem. It's a problem in my conscious mind. I'm, I'm living in torment, and I only get relief from drinking. I found that relief at 12. At 12? At 12, around there. That's when uh, drinking became kind of a rite to passage, weekends, keg parties. At 12? How did you get all the product at 12? Um, easily you steal it from back porches, homes. Uh, there's always the classic, you know, vagrant or a homeless man that would hang out at a corner store. You, you just duke them a, a five and out came the forties. You met the back alley. <laughs> Our guy was, his name was Phil. Phil the bum. Phil the bum. Yeah. Phil would help us. He was the, your alcohol dealer. Yeah. Quote unquote. Or you bought your way into a keg party that high school kids already had their their infrastructure set up for. The high school kids were, were willing to look at a 12-year-old? Yeah, yeah, we were cool 12-year-olds. Uh, I mean, if I took 12, 13, I could roll a J with one hand. I was like, yeah. <laughs> product of a Catholic education in Scranton. You got to know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> if we're going to drink blood on Sundays, you could have a whiskey on Saturday night, you know? <laughs> <laughs> But it was a big relief. I think, um, I think the way I saw the world, uh, even at an early age, starting to feel the idea of economics, went to Catholic school, but my mother, without my dad's support, and her, you know, there's a lot of distress in her family, cutting her off from not leaving my dad. We lived in a project, but none of the kids I went to school with were, seemed to ex be experiencing that life. So I had two sets of friends. You know, roughnecks, and then my friends that went to Catholic schools, it creates a duplicity. Like, I, I'm living a double life. There's two Joes. There's Joe that's kind of the clown, jester at school, and then there's Joe in the projects. It's tough. I have to change my shirt. Um, did, you do, what, did you do it? Were you doing well in school academically? I, I did, but I, I did have ADD, and my mother wasn't going to let me be prescribed anything, um, which was interesting. Was but, that a fear of substance abuse or? No, I just cause she didn't understand it. What causes that? Uh, she thought I was just hyper. I needed different ways to express myself. Uh, I was pretty creative. Um, I think she had a fear of medication, uh, not understanding it. May have helped, uh, but ADD, I don't think, was discussed properly back then. It wasn't described right. as an emotional problem of detachment. It was, it was more descriptive of this. You don't know how to pay attention. And then that just is not, that's an untruth. Uh, I, I'm distracted by my emotional nature and I can't focus my intention on things. Intention is, a, if, if, as you get to know Joe, intention is a, a big theme, a big way of, of, of centering your life and it, it's, recovery. It is. It's, it's something I've been avoiding my whole life. Uh, the intention keeps you aware in the moment or being present. I found most of my life I was planning another life. I was in my head experiencing a different version of life. You were, you were listening to a song and thinking about what you're going to sing next. Yeah, or a life that didn't exist yet. While life was happening, I could be experiencing it. Um, I was off somewhere cognitively retreating. And we call it an ego, but an ego isn't always posturing. It's the fantasy life where things are all right for, for me. Alcohol was the first way to embrace the ego feeling a little more, it was more grounded in reality. It was stronger than a personality maybe I could develop. And I think that goes hand in hand with addiction. Um, my ego protected me a lot faster than the rational things that could happen in a person's personality. Alcohol helped that, marijuana. You're starting at 12. You're drinking straight through high school. Um, yeah. Do you think it's a level of abuse? Were you functioning? Were you... I think it was addiction from the start because when I drank, it, it, 
the effect was something I couldn't produce in myself. It was comfort, a sense of ease, uh, a reality. Maybe I'm one person. Um, it was. It felt relief to a condition that might have already existed. That's the alcoholic I would like in AA. We would describe in my type. They're the people I relate to. Alcohol did something really great for me. Um, now it won't always be the case, but at, initially I think alcohol got me through the tougher parts of adolescence and high school until it started causing problems sophomore year, started being expelled from schools. Uh, because you were, coming to, you were coming to school drunk? Drunk, fights, uh, you know, um, acting out, feeling what some people might not articulate, what I feel most of my education was, you know, lies or some fantastical ideas. Um, I just rejected them through my behavior, uh, being a wise ass and... You know, really developing the, the the parts that attributes that I like to myself, not being afraid of getting in trouble. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I think after a couple of times I was expelled, I did go to an adolescent treatment center at 16. That's when I was introduced to what 12 step life is, what treatment looks like. Um, I did feel a sense of relief. I wasn't ready for recovery in any serious capacity, but I did feel relief that these are people were listening to me. They were people of my nature, and uh, I don't know, it cut the loneliness. Um, and then maybe a year later, I, I, I was in a military reformatory school, uh, got in some trouble uh, for fighting, and I left there and I stayed sober for a few years. About four years, and I was very active in AA. So that was like through your college days. I'm yeah, guessing from, like from I repeated sophomore year because cause the reformatory school was more of a disciplinary for a year, and from sophomore year to sophomore year in college, I stayed sober. Wow, um, very active in Alcoholics Anonymous. Those are like the two le least likely years to be sober, I would imagine. No? It was. You're the freak, man. Yeah. You're the freaky sober kid. <laughs> <laughs> were you were you home were you home at college? Were you a local college? You went, I went to the University of Scranton. So you were local. Yeah. And then um So you were sleeping at home or you were, I was sleeping yeah. at home. Uh, yeah. I started going out more and being social sophomore year. Um more conventionally, going out to bars uh, and hanging out with friends, interested in, in girls instead of reading books about Jesuits. I was, <laughs> I was like, let me put this the on religious the experience of Joe yeah. Van Wee. <laughs> yeah, I was getting pretty radicalized by my own self. Um, but I don't know. It, I felt so odd. I felt like I couldn't connect at the level I saw old friends connecting at in college. I felt like I was on the outside looking in. Um, you you mean socially? Yeah, yeah. socially, intellectually. Uh, the way I experienced, they seemed to enjoy just whatever. She, what could seem shallow just drinking and what am i missing i'm really they really look like they're enjoying themselves i'm so disconnected i I've, it started to i was more drawn to that social aspect of college than what i was identifying in AA. and then i was dating someone broke my heart i think the pain from that pushed me towards wanting to socialize more and i, I thought it was worth the risk i should i should I should drink and I was still alcoholic it's uh, that idea of addiction not having a memory and someone who doesn't treat themselves it's it sounds cliche but it is fascinating it's like I can't measure what the reality was for me two years prior to that I have an addiction if I drink I can die two years later it, it might be safe to drink um, and it, it was just as unmanageable as it was when I was younger and now I could drink more and now I like cocaine um, it keeps me up and I cocaine gave me the effect where I felt normal. I felt like my thoughts were organized. I didn't feel high. I, uh, I'm a madman. Um, I don't know. It made me feel normal. Right. I don't feel normal. Yeah, it's almost like you were starting at like a lower place and it got you to yeah, I need a to level. Yeah. Progression's right. real. Yeah. Uh, and then once I'm drinking, it's, it's, it's almost my emotional nature is that of someone who has PTSD. I can't handle intimacy or relationships or, or things like I have to be on the go. I, don't, I feel like I'm socializing and connecting with people, say like in a bar. It's, a, it's an illusion, but it's powerful because you feel like you're doing that there with strangers, but I don't want to be around my family. It's completely uncomfortable um, because there's a conflict. I know there's two Joes living up there and, and one 
the ones uh bring shame has an identity of shame the addict and the alcoholic in me and that and that was something that you faced with your real with your quote unquote real relationships or deeper relationships or yeah it's hard state, right? I can't live a lie in front of the people who who know me or at least have affection for me or um becomes tremendously difficult. What am I going to talk about? Um, I don't want to be there. I want relief. I want to be around people that drink. They're not re- demanding much of me except mm-hmm. wit and jokes. And <laughs> um, I get really uncomfortable getting close to people. Um, even if I'm Is that something a, that you still struggle with? I can. Yeah. Um, you know, I do it methodically through the steps. Um you know, my commitments to my obligations to help newcomers in AA, I take very seriously because I don't think there's a free lunch in the spiritual terms of getting sober. You have to help newcomers or a guy like I, I do, or I will not stay sober. Um, it's even for your own selfishly. Like yeah. If you're not like, say, for instance, I work up, you know, Lake Ariel. I spend my whole week up there. I enjoy it, but I don't consider that my service work. I, it's a fulfilling career. But outside of work, I have to. I'm, on average, I, I take two people a week through the steps, the process of going through the steps. That's that's my number. That's my that's the debt I owe Alcoholics Anonymous. I feel, and you know, my wife and is comfortable with that. My obligation to my family first, but she knows that's 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 what you need for you. It's the full circle of maintaining my my sanity. I have to be around people who are suffering from addiction. Wow. Yeah. I've I've gone without it, and um, you, my thinking changes. Um, my thinking about myself as well. It's 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 like a it's like a spiritual axiom, and that's it's weird talk coming from guys who was predominantly an atheist. Uh, in the sense, there is a truth to that. If I I I'm relieved from addiction because my hands constantly it has to stay out to someone who who needs the same exact help. Yeah, that's that's the final safeguard to work in the steps that if anything else fails is it, do you think it's because like as 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 if people are counting on you to be sober so that's gonna keep you sober or it's I something think it's one element that? but you know a doesn't get so lofty i always like that about alcoholics non or, or any 12-step program it's it's the paradox of charity it's selfish it's helping me right <laughs> so but yeah in turn someone else is getting help i do owe that action that debt but don't don't mix mix this up. You have let's just all wink and admit this is selfish. This is keeping me sober. Bill helped newcomers for six months without any success. But guess who didn't drink? Bill. <laughs> he started AA. Yeah. Why did Why did that work? In There's Akron, Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I appreciate the history of it much more. How delicate it was. I used to think and how like it could really have not happened. Yeah, yeah. and how about many, that ever like the sliding doors effect of it, you know? How do a hundred arrogant, egotistical people who haven't been drinking for a year take the considerations to write a book together? Right. Letting Bill be in charge, who's the right. most you know ambitious, ego restrained ego man you'd ever meet. How the hell do they pull that off? Is pretty phenomenal. And I think that's always the burden of trying to revise this book. Um, is how that it was you, almost like a miracle in the first how place to do this again right um if it was written today it would probably be much different uh probably be a little more secular um and because god's i think even a more hard word to unpack for a bunch of strangers in a room right but all in all i think it leaves us with the experience in AA and the obligation to help someone read the book together you sit down and you go through what a guy already went through the steps, and and it's not a power based relationship. Hey, this book was written in thirty eight. Let's take a look at it together. Unpack it. How did they intend for you to work the steps? Um, and then, you know, it's up to them to unpack their own definition of God. I never define it to, to anyone I'm working with or or a treatment because it's it's a huge word. What are we gonna? <laughs> how are you gonna do this? It's a loaded word. Yeah. Let's jump for a second to your to your to your career. Um, you're obviously a creative person, um, and you made good on that sort of. Yeah, is that how did that work with? Did it did it, did your addictions did the substance bring out your creativity? Do you think? At do times, you think? I would say, at a high cost. Do you remember 
Did you ever, you know, like Stephen King talks about how he wrote books and he doesn't remember writing them, yeah, you know, and yeah. he was like just in a haze and his locked room. Hemingway, yeah, yeah, you name it. Um, yeah. yeah do you have those, like, do you feel like you had, like, those moments? I do. When I was younger, you know, pot was so mystical when I first spoke it. It makes your mind exploratory. As an adult, I, I've had that experience, but the window is closed if, uh, rapidly. You, I mean, you really go into different stages of addiction. And then there's no return. There is no creativity. There's just relief from a life I'm not I'm not living or want to live. So I think hallucinogenics had an effect on my creativity, not only my creativity, my perspective of life. Uh, but they did not bring back a discipline or a modality to live by like that recovery would. Um, but to say there's no truth to that would be, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's short-sighted. It's not accurate. And you'll never be able to really end the recovery if you don't realize that, I feel like. You know, yeah, like, you don't. Or listen to someone right. who's having that experience. It's in a part of their addiction that doesn't seem fatal to them. Um, I'm going to browbeat them. Uh, right. You don't see the dangers coming. That's not That's not how it works. I mean, I could appreciate where they're at. And nobody has to get sober. They have to want to. And right. I think that's the success of, of recovery communities. So what was it like in Hollywood? Uh, it was heartless, shallow. <laughs> <laughs> Bizarre. Um, desperation. It's just there is a desperation. You got to keep your, you got to go there with a plan. Um, Did you go with a plan? I went there to sell films I made on the East Coast. Uh, and so, yeah, I did. But the air of desperation and, and, and magic could captivate you quickly. A lot of people have no idea who they are, just dying to be someone that they haven't found out yet. Uh, you could be surrounded by that. If you don't have your craft already, you know, polished and what you want to do, what stories do you want to tell? There's no reason to be in Hollywood. Um, what stories did you want to tell? Gritty stories about forgiven, uh, forgiveness, you know, hard ideals. What is the bounds uh, of forgiveness? What's uh, how dark can a person get? Are they, are they still human after that? Do you think that had to do with your experiences with your father? My father, what stories I appealed to uh, that appealed to me. They, were you trying to sort of like, no, I mean to say like, were you trying to, you know, you're, you're talking about that you had like themes of forgiveness and, and understanding the parameters and understanding yeah. like that. And so were, you, were you sort of trying to like find your way back to figuring out a, like how your relationship with your father is and what it is? Maybe a little bit. Be? Yeah, I'm definitely without question to what degree I... I never really measured in my head, maybe a lot to do with myself, uh, thinking I wasn't a worthy person. Um, you know, how was I, I going to measure up to that? Was I going to become kind of a, a, a burnout of talent uh, or a victim of my own life? Like my dad, as, as tough as he thought he was, he was always a victim of some other bigger system over him who was making him, mm. this is how I have to do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I, I guess I'd have to consider that more, but uh, um, I think this year was a, a a year for me. My dad passed last August. He was ill. His health uh -huh. was during COVID, and it was the first, that in that same year I was married and had a baby. Wow! And I started really like being, the true life cycle. Yeah, yeah. It, I re I started a daily meditation practice. I I stayed committed to. A, because it was the immediate need was my anxiety was out of control. The way I measured media, news, uh, I couldn't, it was all untethered. And it wasn't on a time scale that was immediate to A, my wife. <laughs> like, I'm having a baby. Uh, my business is not going to be something I want to recover. Can I, nor do I want to. I can now can admit it to myself. Meditation helped fill this void. What is Joe going to do? Who I've obligated myself to other people I love and care about, but my mind seems still out of control to impulse and fear. When I started to get that practice down, I, I tried a meditation that was called a meta meditation. I just started picturing what, what did my father look like when he was five or six? And he had a hair lip, and it was very traumatic for him. Years of surgeries, it was, you know, the 50s, it was like it butchered him. And um, what did he look like smiling when he was six? And my my child was just born, and I, it just melted every resentment. Now I did 
resentments in the sense of like procedurally writing a resentment, going out and making amends. I've done all. I this was really impactful because I saw my dad as a victim of existence. Man, these are the variables. It really challenges what I think free will is in some respects. You don't get to choose your variables to make your decisions. They've, a lot, probably 90% of them have been cho chosen for you before you were born. And I saw my dad that way, and I forget, it was just forgiveness. I'm like, I almost had the only regret I might have, like, even felt out of that, that meditation. I wish I had more time. So I could have at least to express that to him. You could have to express it to him if he, you know, if he could understand what I was expressing or not. Help, you, I, it help would, you make it real for yourself. I yeah, because I don't want I, I want to limit any kind of trauma or that passing on. Definitely to I, I have a daughter, right. a ten month old daughter now. Where, where does this end? When, when do we when do we become awake to this? That we're, you know, it's not someone's fault. It's a condition that existed, addiction, the drinking. Uh, and eventually, forg and forgiving yourself is for an important step to forgiving your own self. Yeah, is an important step to real recovery. My forgiveness of myself came through forgiving others. Right, uh, I didn't actualize. I could say it. I've heard people say it at a meeting. Somehow, it always made me feel disgusting. Like, who's I'm that tired of being concerned with myself? Half my addiction. That's all I thought. It was just all I think about me. Right. But when I started to forgive people, I didn't expect to. I thought when I wrote them down and someone heard this resentment, they were going to agree with me. Right. Um, yeah, this guy's no yeah, fun. He was <laughs> a jerk. Good, yeah. yeah. Um, when I got tricked into the idea, they might be as broken as me. And for this idea, this big forgiveness ideal could wiggle in. Um, it, it kills that torment of where most of my cognitive life is spent. Uh, in the reliving pain, the idea of resentment to refill. Get rid of this. Real creativity is going to come from healing this. You can't be creative anymore unless you emotionally heal yourself. You're stuck. And, and, and drinking wasn't working, but I could not stop using it. If I felt any kind of emotion or movement in there of the limbic center, that was it. I was toast. I'm drinking that day. I'm going to quit drinking, but it's not going to be today because I'm going to go crazy if I don't drink. What's the, what's the, what's the project? film that you're most proud of um i well it was the most successful one and it all came together organically it would probably be forged tell um, us a little bit about forged forged was a indie film that i uh, went into production we got the script in 2008 went into production around so you were writing you were writing scripts like six people were ended up being the writers on this by the yeah. time it was done where i'm draft 36 by the yeah. it just kept rewriting it and it was a group it was uh uh will wedding josh crook the crook brothers out of new york great indie filmmakers and manny perez who was the star of the film he was my we became close friends on lasoga it was a producer on that in the dominican republic it was his story about the drug trade down there uh, did well at Toronto Film Festival, and that was it's a departure of what you usually see in Dominican films, melodramatic. This was hard guts, kind of it would seem like action to us, but it was drama. Right. When you, it was the highest grossing Caribbean film really? to date um, that was made and produced in the Caribbean. So I, I became close with Manny then, and this script was originally written for Texas and. Um, I got involved, became the executive producer right away, took kind of... What do you, what do you mean written for Texas? Just the script was written in Texas oh, was in the Texas. background for it. It was oh. going to be almost like a biker movie. And if you see it, there's no bikes and you're not in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> um, I immediately said, this is a Scranton script. Let's, I, could shoot, I wanted a film to go shoot my hometown. I'm like, this is like an old Rust Belt, burnt out town. And all you see is ghosts of what, what was. What was. And these little What might have been. Yeah. And uprises criminal factions. And in those criminal factions, you do see a sense of community. Um, that, you know, good, bad, or in between, it's a community. So that was the perfect script. And it was a hard shoot. It was usually, a, we've had days that it was 11 below zero with Windchill. Wow. It's great. And when most 90% of the film's exteriors, it was brutal. Uh, it shot for like 40 some days um went into production post-production for a year we thought i thought i ruined my life making that movie it just hemorrhaged all the money i had and how does that work how does, how does the back end work 
How does the back end work? Changed. You have to yeah. like find investors constantly. Back to... then, it was a different. It was kind of the recipe. It's changed dramatically. Obviously, it's changed a couple times since then. But Netflix wasn't even a real emergence then. It was you're still getting this the foam CD right, cases. The, right. So what you would do is, if you were a rogue producer like me, I was an indie film, but I would put uh, money into making a film with no avenues of distribution. If the film's excellent, I'll go out and win awards for it, and I'm going to sell it to a distribution company. That's probably the most sadistic way to make a movie. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, but, right. And so we we won but a to, lot of accolades to compl- with that completely, one. Yeah. A, compl- a complete gamble, a full oh, gamble. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You're making it before you're selling it. You have no no landing, no safety net. This isn't a reasonable business. It's not for right. rational people. It's 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 insane. You're... You're a madman with creative genius, and you have about a crew of 80 cornies around you, and nobody cares. We how just want to make movies. How are you paying your actors? Um, well, we you would raise the capital, like say the film cost a half a million dollars, you know, and we could pull it off on time. Yeah, you, you, we go and market that as a 1.2 million dollars. Look what we did for 1.2 million dollars, uh, and tried to in reality, court a in reality, does it cost one point two million dollars? No, absolutely not. Much no. more, much less. Much less, much, much less. less. That's the game. How how can we get this done so we can compete with films that are saying they're six million dollar budgets? We're doing it, you know, with a couple hundred thousand dollars and an iPhone camera. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> back then our rig, you know, we thought we were, you know, wow, technology has broke through the camera. I know this is radio, but. It was this big. The lens was this big. This big. Joe's holding his hands yeah, apart at certain four intervals. Four feet apart. It was the red camera. Painted in your head, folks. The red one. It was the first camera that shot 4K, 2007. We were the, like, the first of 20 films to shoot in that, that, with that camera. And it became an industry standard for the next decade wow. using a red camera. And How'd so, you get a hold of the equipment, though? You were able to pay for that? I had a partner. He bought it. He's a, wow. he, yeah, he was a real maverick, political genius of Pennsylvania. Um, and we were partners on an ad agency, but he was a wildcat, man. He, he was a cool dude, but he bought uh, he bought that rig, and that was it. We we were on the, on the making a film with it. Wow. Yeah. And you're recruiting actors, and you're working, we're recruiting actors. What are the days like? It's like they're sh- grueling. Shooting days. And yeah, twelve to eighteen hour days, six days a week on a independent film. It's not a it's not being financed by a studio. Well, you don't have a cushy trailer. This is the only way to pull off that great value expectation of looking, making the budget look great. It's it's very demanding. It's not it's not conducive to a healthy lifestyle or my age now. I would never be able to do that now. Right. Never. Um, I would have to do the Clint Eastwood kind of model, nine to five. <laughs> <laughs> He's always strict with this. But it's it was hard. I was addicted to that lifestyle because politics served it too. A campaign could be three months. My clients could call at midnight, 3 a.m. Joe was a political consultant as well. So yeah. Kind of moving the jumping over here. Yeah, I did. I didn't mean to jump on no, you. No, no, it's, it's they great. They were hand in it's hand. Great. I yeah. made movies while doing Why three doing... campaigns. Uh, wow. Total psychosis. <laughs> <laughs> 12 hours at the, at the at the shoot and then, yeah. and then nights, and nights at the uh, yeah, campaign night, headquarters. Yeah, trying not to frighten... Uh, drinking, a lot of, drinking a lot of coffee. Congressmen. Yeah, drinking coffee. Alcohol. Um, alcohol didn't come in until I relapsed. I was Man. doing that sober. My my last six years, I, I stayed sober from 24, I didn't mention, uh, for the next, for 14 years. And the last four years of that period of sobriety was a total fit of mania. I mean, through sleep, behavior, diet, the way I was treating people. Uh, I didn't recognize I would be able to say, hey, that's anxiety. You weren't like the nice demand. You weren't the nicest guy on the set. I was becoming tyrannical, um, short sighted, uh, objective driven. uh, When, you know, recovery is dependent on how how am I treating other people? I could have these goals, but why am I doing them? I was running from what I was totally afraid of. Because you you did mention that. You feel like you you relapsed before you ever before you ever actually took drugs with or alcohol. Question. Yeah, but talk about that a little bit. What that what that meant to you? Um, like I think there's like a Jelnik curve of what the relapse. It, it it's pretty spot on. I I'd say I, I I hit an existential crisis with AA. I, I knew I was an atheist, and you know a lot of my friends are faithful, but atheist in the degree. I did not believe in the God, A, that I, w- I was raised with. I felt like I was 
an imposter in AA? What am I really saying when I say God? Because I'm saying it at meetings, but I'm saying it not to, you know, cause conflict. When am I going to have this discussion with someone where I can reconcile that I'm not a fraud right. in these steps? I didn't have that discussion. And I, there was a kid I was friends with, a young guy, came to meetings, doing really well for a while, relapsed. And on his relapse, and it was, you know, he got mixed up with uh, some bad guys, and they were they were psychotic. They they killed this kid. Wow. Uh, they executed him. And it was all out of this, like, fake little, like, young crime family. It was so deranged um, to see that happen to him. And the way some people, I, I experienced them talking about it at meetings with such cruelty. That is what happens to you when you relapse. I, I, no, this is not. This drinking alcohol, being executed is not a consequence of not working the steps. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I took that as a wholesale condemnation on why am I wasting my time at meetings? The arrogance and uh, the hubris just started to grow in me that my alcoholism is different. It's relinquished. It's gone. My problems with tolerating people here. Maybe I've outgrown this. That narrative, that story I started telling myself. And that was like when you were hitting 34. That's the relapse. That's that's when I relapsed. When you stopped believing. I stopped believing that that was where the solution was for me, or at least in those people that were all, I share the same affliction that they do and condition. Uh, that, that, was, uh, that was a Rubicon I'm kind of crossed. Having conflicting ideal, ideas of how I was making money, maybe taking a crappy race, maybe a candidate I didn't fully in, believe in, but I'm, hey, I got to get the, keep the lights on. There's those conflicts. Were you getting rich? I was getting rich important yes. to you? Yeah, it was. And it was in conflict to the integrity I wanted to keep, which one was going to win. The fear Money of, sort of super started superseding everything else? It did, because my like fear of not being important was so big, I would do anything. To get rid of that fear. Um, and, and it and failed in the end because it, it wasn't based in truth. It was an adolescent fear I'd never reconciled as, as a man. It, it, my, my purpose for doing these things had no intellectual weight. It was shallow. It was about Joe. It was being important. Yeah, it wasn't being, about... It was about mattering. It was about... I had guys that were with me 10 years. Stop being a concern for them. Here's a guy that's working with me, saw my vision. Um, how do I admit to them I made mistakes or that my, you know, we shouldn't be doing this kind of work? Instead of do, taking responsibility over that, uh, I started blaming others. Um, or if something went wrong and, and it, it really went juxtaposed to who I want to be. And it got so out of control. You start not putting out little fires here and there. Before you know it, you're, my brain just seized. I couldn't make decisions or have emotional relationships. So I started smoking pot to fall asleep. And I told friends that, you know, a, a, marijuana wasn't legal yet, but it was on the curve. So I'm thinking, this could be helpful. And, you know, being that I'm an addict, it was. It wasn't prescribed to me, but it was. I, it started to reduce anxiety, but it didn't solve problems. Right. <laughs> None of these problems got solved. So. I could just maybe go to bed, right. then it stopped working. Then it's causing anxiety in me, and then um, and then you had you headed back down the rabbit hole of alcohol, it wasn't and cocaine, long. And yeah, whatever, all that. They yeah. all kind of just tip your toe in it. I I must not be an alcoholic. I was a mentally ill, angry young man. I am not that anymore. Why is my life defined by fermented fruit? This is absurd. This is right. absurd. I see other people drinking with impunity. Um, I I I got to be able to do this, and if I can't, I'm going to stop. That's for an alcoholic thinking that way. It's it's he's flirting with suicide, and I, that's w when the irrational thought of step one is I'm admitting I have a fatal illness. That was gone, so I was willing to take the risks. Um, and that's were a you married at the time? No, no, I was not. I was not with my wife. I was with someone else, and um, I was just absent from the relationship. Um, addiction was uh, before I even drank. Uh, drinking just accelerated. Uh, it was almost this sub subconscious admittance, not so much immediately that I wanted to die, but I wanted my life to. I couldn't solve any problems in my own life anymore. I was I was checked out. So once I started drinking, that was it. It, it didn't take long. I, I drink 
like a beast. Um, and it wasn't too long, then I wouldn't be really leaving my house. Um, so work, work was, work was, was, I was incapable of working. I'm, I am a stone cold drunk. Um, my brain shuts off. Um, I, I give up on life. I, I become totally nihilistic. Um, and then I'll put it together once in a while to get out of the house, take a job, uh, not alarm the family. I don't want to, cause that's immoral. Don't, right. don't let them know alcoholism's out of control. <laughs> <That'd> right. be, <laughs> what are you thinking? Um, so you know, but it was just on a ski slope and it declined, just going down. It was never coming back up. There'd be moments of grace where I could get a week together or take a bunch of benzodiazepines, get my nerves together, take a job on. The work, it wasn't the film work life. or was political work? Political work. The film work, I was just doing marketing work at that time. And, uh, you know, it, it was starting to show the, my, the effect of work product. I have no shame in admitting it. I told them that. I made these amends. Um, I had to come clean with that. Most of my, I made amends to most of my, my ex clients on that perhaps because, uh, I stopped. You stopped producing work that. Yeah. And I, I didn't want to, I should have like an adult would make a decision a sp or someone on a spiritual path, sit down, re reorganize this to, and be straight with people. Um, I didn't take that course it, uh, by avoiding that course. Addiction takes over the, like this adolescent 16 year old in my brain grabs the wheel. I know how to handle this life. Don't worry about it. Right. Hide. <laughs> and and being and being involved in uh, in politics. Yeah. What did that do to you? Did, were you? It was it an idealistic thing in the beginning, and then it, it sort was. of turned. Yeah. Like it, you were choosing the candidates and the people that you believed in. Yeah, in the beginning. You know, like yeah. you have like the West Wing scene when uh, he yeah. comes in, he's like, "I found that guy," <laughs> and. Yeah. Uh, I found President Bartlett. Was that like your type of thing or was it like, um, you're paying me, I'm going to get you elected? Well, it started by opportunity. And the opportunity showed me an ability. I was limiting myself to just doing films. I was always politically active. But I, I, I immediately knew I was good at it and so did other people. That it was a congressman that wrote the bailout check. And uh, he, was, he was valuing my judgment over someone who was in the industry and, you know, for decades. Right. So flattered by this, uh, I, I just went and redeveloped the skills. I branded myself as a maverick immediately. And that was one congressional race the following year. I, you know, we had four judge races, six state rep races, a state senate race, five county commissioner races. And we run, won 82% of them. Wow. Like, bang, like that. Well, what was wrong with the eighteen percent that lost? They were just bad candidates, There's huh? It's a candidate. <laughs> it's the candidate. <laughs> Look, you can't, you know, you uh, can only take lose, a horse to the, the water. Fault if, yeah. if I win, hey man, they it's, you ain't paying me enough. Yeah, yeah. do you want to be in charge or do you want to win? Usually, it's uh, you got a month left. Is that, your, is that your tagline? Can't line? have both. <laughs> <laughs> so, I did like it, but it, it became a product. Did you feel like you were making a difference? to the world like did it give you that rush more than filmmaking at times or? but it gave me more of a self-indulgent rush and it took me a little while to admit to it i had some great candidates really great guys that uh hold public office i've had some you know below par but everybody does uh but the gratification was coming to me and i knew my integrity wanted to be more intelligent than that I, I, there was a fight going on in my head a total conflict um, and the rise of things getting really binary after 2016, um, Trump and the Democrats, it, it, I felt like I was a part of a problem, no matter if you're left or right, instead of a, sol a solution. It was so polarizing. And um, it was really like I almost sabotaged, before I stopped drinking, my own business, political business, by having active... <laughs> protest and organized activism that wasn't being paid for by any candidate organization and um it was frightening even my you know left my more conservative friends so that was one creative way to deal with it <laughs> but you were mostly running you were mostly running campaigns to the left right uh, for, for the left yeah, yeah. and I, I lean that way and then i you know COVID changed everything for me my political discourse of like and my wife and my family my obligations to them of of, of just finding a, a moderation to the way i'm perceiving media and universe my own kool-aid or what, what we were all getting fed into this pandemic wherever you came from 
I didn't see any value of what is this doing for us, yeah, nation, species. Yeah. I'm like, I really wanted to measure. How, how am I going to move forward? Uh, these political ideologies don't fit with anything that got me sober, this mindfulness practice, this presence. Am I present for the person sitting in front of me instead of having a Facebook fight over or climate change? These are all important, valuable issues, but my stance on them uh is kind of a luxury I don't have anymore that I want to express. I found where I'm going to have the most impact, say you got 30, 20 years to live or 40, whatever's left in there. Do I, do I want to spend time, you know, pissing up a rain pipe or do I want to help addicts and alcoholics? I have a lot of experience doing that. It almost killed me. I don't want to waste time. I, I know how to talk to addicts and alcoholics. I don't have to make a, a come, you know, with the flag or a cross, I could come that, hey, I have experience. I, I almost died of addiction. Um, can I share it with you? And can I listen to you? So, you know, coming coming from the high adrenaline and high rush yeah. type of situations like filmmaking, like getting making winning awards, like being involved in the thick of a political campaign, you know, is this enough for you? Um, Today, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Do you miss the rush? Are you looking for it? Have you found a way to replace it? Are you at peace? The rush was it was great, but the cost was terrible. I think all alcoholics, my kind of nature and type of personality, need adventure. Uh, it's been replaced. It's been replaced It's it, because boredom for me is usually a, a crisis of, of an existential crisis, experience boredom. Um, I, I've never been present for my life in the way I did now, uh, just because of the consequences. I love my wife. Um, I love having a child that I can't experience it unless I'm home when I'm home. And when I'm at work, I'm at work. I've never, I never parse those. And, and am I going to be the same Joe? This might sound like cutesy, but like, it's fun. Is your sense of adventure because of the way your mind is centered now and with your intention and everything else? Is, your, is that giving you that sense of adventure? Just experience your life with your wife, with a child. Yeah. Um, sort of like viewing, you know, the world through your little baby's eyes that are growing up. Or, you know, this all sounds like cutesy stuff. But No, yeah. This, you know, like, this is, where my, this, is where my sense of, this is where my sense of adventure is coming from. Like, I don't need to be, you know, screaming at some political intern to, you know, you know why'd you F this up? You know yeah. what I mean? Like Drop and it, give it, me 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sort of like living your life re and really instead of like living it in your like self-made TV show. Yeah. Know? Yeah. I, I, thank you, Shlomo. <laughs> I'm like listening to you going, yeah, yeah, I guess that's a, that is the consideration. I guess that's how you describe it. Yeah. I've, I've never been present into the moment. Uh, a lot of excitement came from plans. Plans were executed. Boredom arose. Oh, this wasn't what I thought it would be, or this was great, but it, that feeling, what am I going to sustain it for months? Ah, that was great. It's insane. I have an addict mind. I, I, and Is there any world where you see yourself, you know, in, in sort of a regulated way? Is there any way you see yourself going back into that world? Um, no, um, not at any, any way that would be recognizable when I was there. No, nothing that I could recognize. Um, what, that, what you have left to give, you want to give to to the to the to this community to recover our community. Um, I think it keeps me focused, like a scalpel. Um, I'm always cognizant of time and the value of it. Now that I'm sober, um, I've had a lot of projects. I would it would take for every one project I got done, I had ten that weren't. Basically, what I'm asking you is, if I would run for office, would you run my campaign? You're not getting it. <laughs> oh, sure. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. What's your budget? That's, the, that's always the question. You you have a two hour meeting, and there's only one thing on everyone's mind: what the budget is. And you got to talk about things for two hours to say who's going to tell us what the budget is. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm happy now. Right now, my life has been pieced together in a way. That is, it's refreshing. It's present, um, and it, it, the sense of obligation I'm giving others is is in considerations I'm putting before myself are making me feel more alive than thinking about myself. 
how I could get rid of my own fears, match my ambitions with hiding my fears. I exhausted that. I can't, I almost died doing it. And that that's the consequence for addiction. My mind at recovery has to meet truth. I have to be looking for truth. I don't know where that lies I have to be reading like the intellectual like when we talk about a spiritual awakening and recovery it really is an awakening to why can't you be present what is tormenting me um once that's reconciled it's a commitment to stay present and that requires new information reading a practice it's not this redundancy the the, the rituals are redundant but the information grows of what it means to me and Listening to you say that was the first time I considered, oh, I guess that's what I did. <laughs> Glad to be of service, Joe. Thank you, Shalom. <laughs> Where do you think treatment needs to get to? What do you think the next, uh, you know, the next, the next rung is, the next hallowed ground? What are we not doing that we could do better? I don't a, know what the a, answer is. Um, to see, you know, in the last five, six years, heroin totally transitioned to a synthetic version, fentanyl. Is a frightening prospect I, I, that you could be in your first week of your addiction, 16, 18, and without pay, experiencing the consequences of losing a job, school, your parents, even finding out you're using drugs, you can die. And it, could happen, the, it could happen that quick. The probability is astro astronomically different than it was 10 years ago. So to reach that kid, usually... You know, the last six decades of treatment was this awareness you would have to come to from an inkling desire that you're in danger. How do you develop that in a week? And I think Lake Ariel is constantly talking about this and doing really creative things to address this. How do you break into a mind that doesn't know fatalities around the corner? The risk they're taking with fentanyl is far different than me floundering through high school smoking pot and drinking. You know, car accidents happen, these tragedies happen, but not at the astronomical scale as opioid deaths. 80,000 climbing, six figures probably this year. It's, it's, it's mind-bending. Mind-bending to, to think uh, this is not being addressed. What can you do to reach that person? Is it, is so, a, is it, so ultimately, I'm talking in, in terms of scalability, yeah. is it really not about reaching the person that's already in, it's about really really laying groundwork in schools education um in, inserting that concept of this is fatality and it's around the corner that's the long ball game it, you, every time i've seen it done we've seen does the it failure, work? monumental failures of it no it doesn't we mean can't it won't work i think it was the product that didn't work um what will work um is identifying trauma in schools traumas the victims of trauma or experience, not so much the event, will be your future addicts and alcoholics and reaching them at a scale that if the addiction does start, it doesn't have to be fatal. It doesn't have to be mind-numbing, abusive. This is an addiction. You could identify it earlier. They can. I think what a good education based to identifying first, identifying the kids that have, have trauma in their homes or experienced it, um, what you can do. And a lot of it's really listening. Once you identify them, don't pigeonhole them under that idea. Who's listening to this kid two hours a week? Let him express what's going on at home. Then when he uses his first drink or drug, and it has that kind of marriage to trauma, it feels like a solution to it, um, that a, a bigger truth is going into that addiction. Oh, this might be an addiction. And you can know that before you lose everything. Right. We still have a lot of work to do. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. We're all stuck here together. Let's, yeah. let's make it nice. Let's figure it out, right? Let's get it nice here. Yeah. <laughs> let's get it. Yeah. Any, uh, any message that, like, means a lot to you that you want to share? Um, sort of like, you know, a message to the people. Anybody who wants to know, like, how, you know, I, I think about this a lot. Like, there's people, I ask most of my guests this, uh, you know, Everybody sort of sees it happening on the fringes. Everyone's living with it. Someone's neighbor, someone's kid, someone's, you know, yeah. this guy overdosed that kid and didn't make it home. That kid went to college and never came home, you know. Um, how can people, just regular people, just be involved in sort of the an effort to, you know, for recovery? What can I, what can I do in my little patch, my little, you know, my little eight feet? What can I do to make an impact? 
Uh, I'm not working in a recovery center. You know what I'm saying? That's not my career. I I, uh, I sell insurance. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you could do. If it starts by listening to people. You might find out you're you, you're standing right next to someone with an active addiction, a collapsing life that you wouldn't recognize immediately. Asking questions, t- taking the fear to ask someone a question, maybe listening to them. Um, you'll find out they have an addiction pretty quick, especially if they don't want to talk, caring. My message that I always like to, I've been in and out of AA, and I took such an approach that it was never going to work again, this community. I, you know, I'm different. And I would, I would present it as almost Pascal's wager, but not to the leap of faith. If, if, if you're giving up, and you're in that much pain in an addiction that you're, you're going to reconcile, the idea of dying is far more comfortable than approaching sobriety. Being sober is not the answer. That's what I would say to them. A, a spiritual awakening is the answer. That's different than being sober. And before you give up, try one more time. And that's what I did. And that's why I'm sitting here today. And it was because three friends came to the house and confronted me and confronted the truth. This is what's happening. You're dying. And I took the chance. And, and it, you know, two years later, my life is, is revolutionarily, di- like it's revolutionized compared to what I was living. Uh, so it's also, it was about three friends that cared about you. It was, yes. it was. You know, and they cared about me because I cared about them at one point. I wasn't being such a good friend at the end of my addiction, but um, they came. They knew I was sick. It wasn't that I was a bad friend. I was very sick, and I, I couldn't see how sick I was. I needed a lot of help. I needed time. I needed to be in a safe place to have that time. Guys, you heard it from Joe. Before you give up, try one more time. Thank you very much, Joe, for uh, giving us the time today. Um, for sharing your message, sharing your story. Everybody who listens to Rubber Bands, please listen, subscribe, post, say how good we are, tell the world. It's been another episode of Rubber Bands, conversations about the push and pull of addiction. Uh, with our live in-studio guest, Joe Van Wee. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll be back soon. <laughs>